very good evening, Stats Race Lens users. Welcome to summer and welcome to the second half of the racing calendar. When we left you last, we talked about the United Nations and we talked about some of the speed. I think we had some tremendous information. Ellis, you had a good handle on the bigger picture. That was uh, a big help. Uh, one of the one of the prime directives uh, out of our last get together with us tonight, Ellis Starr, of course, uh, the Uber Capper, and Craig Walker uh, as well from Stats Race Lens. Ellis, evening. Good evening, Steve. Good evening, fan. Thanks for joining us. Craig, welcome back. Hi, glad to be back. Uh, hello, everyone. Well, it, we're at that juncture. Calendar turns to July, and we get this close to Del Mar and Saratoga. The excitement really builds, but something that's been really consistent, whether it was the racing in New York last week, uh, the Stars and Stripes Festival, the Arlington Million Preview, what we dealt with a couple of weeks ago before July 4th, there's just been a consistent set of weekends that racing has just been, I, I think, really compelling. And, you know, here we are with one of those kind of interim weekends going to places like Indiana and Los Al and Delaware. And, uh, yes, Songbird's going to be 1 to 19, but <laughs> fact is the racing looks really good. And we're going to dive in. We're going to talk about the little track that's good. Delaware Park, which if you've never been, is an absolute pleasure. Maybe the nicest paddock in all of racing, and uh, they've got a very nice card. And of course, the star attraction in the Dell Cap, Songbird. Uh, later in the afternoon, we'll start the conversation. And uh, Ellis, the Hokessen, race seven. Give it a check. Well, I think it's an interesting race here. You know, one of the things that we all should try and do when we use race lens is uh, look at the pace scenario. I look at the field first, and then I look at the pace scenario because I kind of had a hunch that it was going to be hot, but I wanted to kind of get a feeling for how hot. And, you know, again, I know a lot of people have been with us for other webinars, but two things race lens helps you do pretty easily is you can assess running styles based on some great algorithms Craig and some other folks have worked on. Uh, and in this case, you can sort any of these column headers. And as you can see, people that are watching the screen, I just sorted in alphabetical order, which puts the E's on top. So debt, ceiling, and chief line are both E for early. In case you don't know what it means, you can always hover over it. It shows you that. And then a couple of those are early presser. But the pace projector really shows that these two horses are going to be out winging. And the actual numbers are way over 100 here, 198 for the three and the seven. And, of course, you can go either way. You can look at the PPs first, or you can look at uh, the pace projector first and validate it, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to go, okay, well, the pace projector shows one thing. Do I agree? And I'm going to first look at the three here, of course, debt ceiling. And as you can see, debt ceiling at the second call, which is the primary call for a short race of sprint, he's first, second by three back ahead, lead, particularly when he wins. Here he goes, he's really either ahead back, and here – uh, another head back uh, all the way. And then you go out to the seven, which is the other horse that the pace projector showed, which is Chief Lion. And yes, he's finished eighth and seventh his last two, but he's really pushing it early here. Um, I have mine set to pace figures, and you can see those are really high pace figures. 116, 114, dropping 97. That's typical of a horse that goes out really fast and has a problem finishing. Um, even when he won here, that's a 90, 97, 111. That was the inner track at Aqueduct. But You've got two horses here that do not win, for the most part. There's one race here which he rated, but lately, do not win unless they get the lead. So that was my scenario of the race, Steve, based on that. And I had already been looking, but it kind of validated who I thought. And I'm going to start with the six, always sunshine here, morning line at five to one. And last time out of parks, that was on the grass, five furlongs. This isn't a grass race. I'm not going to worry about it. One back, you see a combat here, or bumps and pinched the brakes. Not going to worry about that. Now you start looking at the races, which there was no trouble, and it was on dirt. And you see a nice win here from just off the pace. You see a rally from fourth to miss by a head to Chief Lion, who had his own way in that race. Uh, you see some other nice races back here, the Maryland Sprint, which is a great three. So you've got a great three winner here 
uh, with some very solid echo base figures from this period of time, 113, 114, 118. I wouldn't be disturbed by these two figures of 85 and 89 because I said they're not representative. One was a troubled race in which he found himself seven back, not a half a length or a length back as he had in his good races here last summer and his win on the comeback in May from October to May. And so I think that's the kind of race he can run back to any one of these. My other main contender here is Never Gone South, a two-horse. Again, beneficiary of the pace. Last time out, sat off the pace, drew off by two. At Laurel was Sheldon Russell. Russell's riding back here. Uh, a nice horse. He's earned 237000 in his career. Um, he's a previous stakes winner way back when, and I have mine set the lifetime PPs. He won the Frank, uh, way back when, I'm sorry, it was a year and a half ago. He won the Frank Whiteley uh, as a three-year-old at Laurel wire to wire. But since then, he's matured a little bit. Here he came on from sixth to fourth to second. And so those are the main two. I'm going to use the H truth, but I'll let Craig talk about him because I know Craig had some very significant notes on him. Yeah, so on Struth, um, when, I, when I looked at the, that last race, um, same thing as Ellis has talked about before. When you look at the um, at, at his past performances in the last race. Okay. I lost him. Hold on. Sorry. Sure. I wasn't copy with me. There we go. Okay. Yeah, this so you page. see the like uh, like Ellis always says to look for the on the comments on the right when you see the small red triangle before the comments that means that the horse had trouble. So he got uh, sideswiped out of the gate. I mean, uh, people who use race lens can uh, click on the um, little video icon to to watch the video, but he did get knocked uh, t t towards the rail. Uh, he was in tight the whole way. Um, he showed some courage, I thought, to uh, finish well, and so he finished uh, right right behind, never gone south. And so I, I think that wasn't representative. Uh, if you look at the race before, he ran a 114 Equibase speed figure, you know, off the claim. So I think um, that's more representative of the type of speed figure that he can earn today. And um, when you look at the very top of the race header underneath, the stakes designation in six furlongs. You see CR 111. That means this race has a class rating of 111, which is the uh, the ballpark of what the uh, Equiway Speed figure is likely to be for the winner. So that 114, I mean, looks strong in this race. And also, if we um, go to the True Odds module, we can see that he looks to be um, on the outside early and then he should get good position coming around the turn and so that's going to be a much better trip for him I think than last time getting stuck inside and especially when you see the um, when we show the when you look at the adjusted true odds column whenever you see the yellow highlighting that means that the that the horse is um, likely to go off a, um, an overlay or can go off an overlay so you can see the fair odds are three to one on the adjusted true odds but his morning line is eight to one, so he's likely to go off uh, as a good price. And so for me, I mean, that's that's where I like to start. So I kind of do things opposite than Ellis. I usually look at this page first, the True Odds page, and then go back and start looking at the the PPs and trying to to figure things out from there. And sometimes I I, I look at the P, PPs very lightly and just you know just go off. A strong play that I see here in, in this case it's it's the eight for me I mean he's going to be a key horse Steve what do you think you know I, I only glance at this I really have not given it a, a serious enough look to, to come up with much of an opinion to be honest that's fine no it's better 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 than that than six seven <laughs> yeah no I, I just a little late getting to uh, to this to this card, although it, you know it is nice. I mean, I, the obviously the Songbird situation is, is one of the most remarkable walkovers uh, you'll, you'll ever see. But <laughs> the rest of the card, including a two-year-old allowance race, you know, Delaware is, uh, yesterday too. You had or Tuesday you had a two-year-old non-winners at two already. 
I mean, there's like there's almost no racetrack in the country that's running two year old allowances, and Delaware's had a couple this week. So, uh, wow. for those that haven't been looking at the Delaware cards, Delaware and Monmouth uh, have been have been sneaking in a lot of good racing. Let's talk about the other graded stake on the card. That's the Kent Stakes, 63rd running, and this mile and an eighth, kind of a, a kind of a parallel race to the Dixie at Pimlico. And uh, some interesting players turned up in here, uh, including some names that uh, you've become familiar with as the se- season is, has gone on. And that includes Penn Mile winner Frostmourne for, for Soft Clement and Master Plan, who you know, looked like a, a derby-type horse when he was closing uh, in Dubai uh, and then was dreadful in the Peter Pan. And uh, he made the transition to turf, and he's going to follow up in here. And he gets one of the hottest riders in the country in Tyler Gaplion. Craig, you want to kick it off? Sure. Yeah. So uh, we can uh, uh, let's go look at the true odds module. Okay. And for for me uh, in this race, um, if you uh, can change it to the odds, Ellis, we get a chance. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> no problem. So the, the this is a, a case of a, a low priced overlay, I would call it. So in the race lens algorithms, um, the horse looks to it looks like a two horse race um, with seven to five for Frostmourne. He's eight to five morning line odds, and then a uh, number five to two master plan. When I see a, a smaller field like this with seven horses, and I can see when I'm looking at the 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 um, race projection on the right, and I see the comments that the pace should unfold as expected, and I see the six horse, you know, it's projecting the setting, um, you know, in the garden spot kind of. That for me right there means, okay, this horse is, is a strong play, so especially when it shows it as as a, a slight overlay. And then when I see the number five master plan, as uh, the clear second choice, and I know he's a, a Pletcher trainee. I mean, for me, I don't, I don't need to go too much deeper into the race. That that's going to be the way that I handicap and just go with, with true odds in this case. Uh, and the main reason I'm doing that a lot of times is, is, uh, it just you know, handicapping can be a grind, and so I, it, there are certain times when I, I think. You need to spend a lot of time in the PPs, and other times it's better just to um, not spend as much time and just try to use tools like race lens, using the race projection and the the true odds to help you um, try to to get some races get an answer quicker and and just save energy and move on on from there. Well, I looked at it a little different, and uh, I I will since we're on the true odds page, I'll start with this. Um, I did think the scenario looks pretty good, but it is turf race. And I am looking for a horse that's going to close. So I sorted on late pace, and Frostmourne's a given, given his record and everything else. But the next one down the list is the two Lunaire. Now, the True Odds has it at 9-1, to one, and certainly if you buy that, the 9-2 to two morning line or anything close to it is not an overlay. But I view it a little differently here because I think the pace is going to be maybe a little bit fast, and I'll go to that in a second. Uh, and Lunaire really is the best closer in the field next to Frostmourne, and that's good enough to take a shot because if Frostmourne gets any kind of traffic, you've got Lunaire at a price. I'm not going to discount Frostmourne at all. And the things I like about Lunaire besides that late pace figure and the difference in the odds of 8-5 to versus 9-2 to for a very – similar late pace figure is the fact that Lunaire gets somebody named Mikey Smith who's warming up to him. This is one of his warm-up races for the big one with Songbird. Um, And, you know, he didn't have to take this mount. He took it. Um, Certainly with the high percentage that he's riding it right now, that has me sitting up and take note right away. Another thing has me taking note is the italics here from this last race. Now, Lunaire was beaten three quarters of a length, a nice rally, six back at the quarter pole, beaten three quarters, brick and mortar one by three quarters. So realistically, Lunaire was beaten two heads for fourth. But 
the 100 figure is improving figure for the horse's pattern, 77, 96, 100. Smith's riding. Now, I have this set right now at, uh, at pace figures, and I don't want to go back and look at traction, but I will tell you that in that race, Frostborn ran the last quarter mile. I'm sorry, the last, yeah, quarter mile. Ran the last quarter mile in 22 seconds flat. Um, and, I mean, Lunair did. And Frostmore ran about 22 and a half. If Lunair and Frostmore are close to each other at the quarter pool, and they both repeat those efforts with Frostmore running 22.5 and Lunair running 22 flat, I'll take Lunair every day of the week because that is a two and a half length difference, basically, between one horse and another. Also, you see these two, the key race here, as I said, she lost by uh, a head and uh, a couple of heads per second. When I want to check out what those horses did, whether they did it by going down in class or up in class, we know this race was an allowance, optional claiming. It was a $90,000 first. Um, it was a non-winners of one other than. So the first thing I want to see is what did brick and mortar do? And I look into what brick and mortar did. Oh, well, he came out of the race and he won the Manila Stakes. So that's not bad. A $100,000 race at Belmont, uh, you know, in a field of seven. Uh, beat a really nice horse in Secretary of War, I think we talked about earlier in the year. And Snap Decision came back to win. He came back to win that allowance level. So two horse, two of the three horses that beat Lunair came back and won. So I'm expecting improvement off Lunair. You've got Smith. So I'll take that any day of the week for a win bet. I'm going to use Frostmourne. I think those two are the horses to use in the exact on top, the two and the six here in the Kent. And then I'm going to use Master Plan, who we talked about, he talked about. I'm going to use him in second because he's on a nice improving pattern here. He has a race over the track. The fan was at Delaware, so that's important. But if I'm using Master Plan, I've got to use Adonis Creed, the three. Master Plan opens at two to one, as you can see. Adonis Creed at six to one. Now, a length and a half is at the head. Usually, if a horse gets beat ahead and the odds are way out of whack, I'm really excited. But still, you've got to clear the glock on trainee here on a horse that just ran horrible in the Murphy, but came back, with a, had a win before, and then the second place finish here. He's going to be near the lead, it's on the lead. He, here he closed a little bit at Gulfstream, but here was on the lead. Here he made a middle move and tired. Um, so I'm definitely going to play that. So my exact play is the two and the six over the two, three, five, and six. But I like Lanier quite a lot here in the Kent. You know, Lanier has, has done nothing but exit live races. It's quite something, actually. And even even that uh, that race on uh, Derby weekend uh, at Gulfstream in the English Channel, uh, you know, Bronson just uh, was purchased the other day by uh, Three Diamonds in the Horses of Racing Age sale. And the horse that was second uh, in that English Channel, General Magooby, he came back and won uh, on, I think, uh, must have been July 3rd or or July 4th uh, won that little stake uh, for Lily Curtin at Gulfstream. Uh, nothing but, yeah, nothing but live races. And, of course, Brent yep, Warner just won the other day. Yep. The not decision. surprising stakes. Yep. Yep, the not surprising. There it is right there. So off that, off that uh, race to uh, Bronson, he ran uh, fifth and came right back to win a stake out of that one. So, uh, yep. he gets a field of 10. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the, and it's funny, Tom Albatrani, for, for all the success you think about Albatrani in terms of you know, Bernardini and whatever, his all of his most recent hitters have been turf. Suddenly he's, he's winning with, with turf horses left and right. Uh, it's become it's a kind of a strange, one of, those, one of those little oddities, a little training pattern. I'd love to break out what, what Albatrani has been over the last couple of years in, in terms of in terms of his dirt numbers and his turf numbers. Well, and, we Alice, can do that. sure. One thing, Alice, can you just uh, yep. click back on the 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 most recent chart for um, Lunar again? I just wanted to mention right. to people, uh, and and I know yep. you meant to say it, but so when you see um, now in the in the charts and race lens, when you see circles, that means that those horses won their next start. So uh, a green circle means it was at where we have our class ratings, it was at the same level of this race or higher. And if it was a yellow circle, it means that they went to a, a race with a, a lower class rating, but they still won the race. So that's just a quick way when you're looking at charts to know 
to spot key races because you can see, oh, these horses came out and won their next starts. I mean, I know in the PPs you can see the see the italics to see it, but a lot of times horses who run fourth, fifth, or sixth could can win, and, and this makes it an easy way to, to spot key races. Yep. I just want no, to mention that. Absolutely, you're right, Craig. Sorry, I missed it. Hey, uh, Steve, so you said something, and this is what handicappers do. So, you know, we can break script here for a second. Uh, you made a comment about you're just to know how Albertani does in certain situations. And when I'm handicapping, sometimes I decide I don't, I'm done handicapping the race for a second. I am curious about this because I want to make a mental note of it. So, what were you look? What what information were you trying to glean about Albertani? Just what you know, what he's been doing lately. Is, you know, the last call it the last I don't know, maybe two years. It, it it feels like he is winning way not not way more, but a, a little disproportionately with turf. I mean, all of his most recent stake winners in memory have been turf horses, and well, whether 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 he's getting those type from you know from Godolphin or or what it is, uh, it's just kind of interesting that it, right now when I'm thinking of when I'm watching Albertrani in the PPs. I I I sense that he's winning more often with grass horses. And and you're absolutely right. I just sorted on the date here, and he's got 25 turf route wins in the last two years, and seven of them are this year. And we only have a half a year, so that's a pretty good number. Now his ROI on 229 starts is only minus five. His win percentage is low. But you can see why that is by looking at somebody's prices, 15 to 1, almost 9 to 1, 11 to 1, 17 to 1. So it looks like some of his horses are really coming in under the radar, uh, his grass runners, over the last year. So it's interesting. If you say he's in the money percent, win percent are lower than what you consider average, but it doesn't matter because when he does hit them, um, he's hitting them pretty good. And like I said, the seven – winners uh, of 25, but those seven in the first six months of this year kind of skews it to exactly what you're feeling. I think if I went and changed it like to the, to the last six months just for the heck of it, uh, which would basically be, you know, Gulfstream winter, and it would be uh, Gulfstream winter, and then, of course, the New York circuit, if he's had any horses here. So let's just change that real quick. And this is really cool stuff people can do. You make a note for next time. So you could, Or you can set up an angle. After you look at this, you go to angles and you say, trainer and you include Tom Albertrani turf route. I want to get notified. I don't have to go looking. Um, so this is a, about the same. It's seven wins out of 54 starts, 13%, but it's that same minus 5% ROI. So a lot of the one, two, looks like two double digits and a bunch of horses at five to one, six to one, etc. cetera. So uh, your, uh, your gut feeling, Steve, was absolutely correct. Cool. Well, and uh, you know, it's, this is, it, it, the advantage you, you have with with a product like this, with a, a with a tool like this, is you can go down the rabbit hole and and back up your assumptions. You, you can yep. you can go you know you can have a sense of something, and you know, sometimes you look it up and and you're surprised uh, how right you are, and and there's times you'll look it up and and realize that you know you've overestimated, but that's uh, that's the advantage. I'll tell you a short story. I had a conversation with a uh, customer the other day, and he, he all his life on pencil and paper, he had this in his head. He wanted a horse that was uh, a half a length or less behind the leader at the first call and a half a length or less behind the leader at the second call. And the next race... Uh, the horse was nine to one or better. And he said, can I do that? And I said, I think so. Let me make sure. And we programmed that angle in about five minutes. And now this gentleman that his whole life has been doing this in pencil and paper and pencil and paper and pencil and paper now has the angle. So he can get notified anytime a horse has that uh, in his last race history and he gets to get notified. Then he just checks to see if it's the odds he wants or not. Um, that's just what's remarkable about this, that all these things we've drudged over all the years can now be, many of them can be isolated, something that we can accomplish in a few minutes and turn our handicapping from uh, reactive to proactive. So it's very cool. Very much. Well, let's take a quick glance 
at Songbird and let's figure out if there's any way <laughs> she could be beaten uh, in the Dell cap. Well, let me just say, you know, she can't be beaten. But, you know, if you want to play the race, you don't play the race. Let's say you were going to put 20 or 30 or 40, 50 bucks in a race. You find other ways to do it. So I got two strategies here. I'm playing a pick three starting in the seventh, um, and I'm probably going to play uh, – I've got four horses in the seventh, and uh, uh, I'll probably use all four in the eighth. Uh, Lunaire and Frost and Warner Master Plan and Adonis Creed. The seventh, I'll use Always Sunshine, Ever Gone South, 83, uh, and Struth. And then single songboard, so a $16 ticket. And as far as this race here, I think there's two horses to stand out for second. You know, I was thinking about this today because my math skills were a little light. And I was thinking, okay, second pays $150,000. And I was trying to back into what the purse would be. And it's, of course, a $250,000 purse pays one hundred and fifty of the winners. That, that's right, Steve, isn't it? Say, uh, say again, seven fifty. Uh, 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 no, no. Well, it's one hundred fifty thousand for second here. And what I'm saying is, if this was a, a two hundred fifty thousand dollars stake, that'd be one hundred fifty thousand for first, sixty percent, right? Yes. So basically, a lot of horses that would would be running for the hills, not even think they could even run in a quarter million dollar per stake, can run here for second and pick up that kind of money. That's why I'm so surprised we have a short field, because I think these, this day and age, there should be a lot of horses trying to get the 250 here, and I'm not sure why they're not going for it. That's just a, a, a side note. Uh, my, my play is going to be an exact of the 5 over the 2-4. The 2 is Martini Glass, uh, who is in tremendous form, not nearly as good as Songbird, no way, no how, but you've got some part here, has made the lead in the last four races, got beat a neck, opened up and it stretched her advantage out in those other three to start her, I think a four, she's a four-year-old now, to start her four-year-old season. And certainly she can run second to Songbird. And then the other one is the four, who is kind of best fit. Same activity here. She's got five wins in her last six races. She really, some of them stretched out, some she just opened up. Quality of the fields weren't anything near Songbird, of course. So, you know, if these exactors are paying four dollars each, uh, you bet two to get four back. I could be playing a ten dollar exacta, uh, five two five four, and bet twenty and get forty back. You're not getting forty back betting Songbird to win at one to nine. No, no, Craig, any any insight? No, I didn't really have anything. Um, just, you know, if you do go the true odds, it's it's like what everyone thinks, that Songbird's going to get an easy lead and, and just yeah, that's, keep on going. Let me so, show that. Just, just to validate that, let me go the true odds and show everybody. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is kind of darned if you do, darned if you don't, right? Because if you leave her alone, she crushes you, and if you go with her, you get crushed. All right, so I, I didn't really have any, you know. Ellis had a good take on who he thought could run second. I, I, I had no solid opinion, so that that's kind of the way I saw it. Very good. Well, let's shift over to Indiana Grand and the Oaks and the Derby. Uh, it really kind of came up, came up interesting. And there's a, there's kind of a wacky mix of horses in, in these races. And we'll start with the girls. We'll start in the eighth. The Indiana Oaks and uh, the Grade Three. Ellis, uh, start this conversation. Well, I think this is an interesting race. Um, you've got a heavy favorite here in Mopatism, who I can't knock a whole lot. But we got a horse that I don't know. I, I seem to recall we talked about this horse on one of the uh, one of our previous webinars, but I'm not sure. I don't remember what dates we actually did some of these things. But I'm going to talk about majestic quality. And, you know, the main reason I talk about this is I have this angle, and now it's just slightly less. Whenever you hover over an angle now, it shows you what the success score and ROI is. Minus three is not bad. But I have this angle, and I'm going to bring it up. And it's the Sorno Brothers in Dirt Routes. And, you know, Keith uses his brother Kent a pretty good amount, and they win a fourth of the time. Better than that, 
almost 70% in the money and a minus three ROI. So, I mean, you're beating the takeout by a significant amount when you see Kent either coming in or trying to, or, or, or actually you know, riding a horse like this. And this is an interesting horse. They were so high on this horse earlier in the year that even though she was an 04 seven maiden, they put her in the race, they shipped her across country and put her in the race with Alexandra and she runs second to Farrell. Um, Scratched out of the fairgrounds, Oaks, comes back seven days later to the Santa Anita Oaks, runs just horribly. Little traffic trouble, I mean, maybe a lot. I didn't look at the video because it didn't matter because I didn't think she was ever in contention. Drop her in for the maiden rank as she gets her confidence back, a 106 figure, and then the summertime Oaks. Now, she wasn't involved in the incident that, that Spooky Woods caused to get disqualified. I think it was another horse further back that got uh, in, in trouble with Spooky Woods that, that ended up that uh, Majestic Quality was moved up to third. But I'm telling you, she was rallying, and, and I'm just going to show the video real quick because I think this is a typical move on the part of the Soma boys sometimes to do this. Let me turn the volume off, and we'll go down to about here. And she is the well, she's in the Big Chief Racing green colors. I think she's the seven. Yeah, so she's dead last back here. And I'll just kind of follow her with my hand. And don't forget, she's essentially coming off a of maiden win at this point, even though she had that stakes placing. And if Kent is apt to do with a horse that he thinks is going to run well, he wheels her outside. I mean, she's running against some decent horses here, of course, in Fapian and Mopatism. But she's not going to stop running. And right the last 50, 100 yards, I mean, she's picking it up, and he's not hitting her much. He's not giving her a lot of encouragement, and she's still finishing out. I don't know if she gallops out on top or not, but let me see. I don't remember if she did or not. Always like to see that, too. Now he kind of eases her up. Anyway, she's no big shakes here at 3-1 to one morning line, but I think she's going to be very, very tough here. Um, the eight, Mopatism, of course, as I said, can't knock uh, much at all. Uh, I do actually, it reminds me, Craig, Craig made a point. I want to go back. If you go back and look at Majestic Quality's race, that's why I sometimes say you should check a, click on a chart even if you don't see a horse in italics because I just remembered this and I've forgotten before. When you look at the chart here, it is well ran uh, fifth, rich, fifth initially in the race, in, the, in this race. And I'm assuming she was the one that interfered with because Spooky Woods got put behind her. And it as well came back to win the Delaware Oaks last week and pick up a hefty check in a $300,000 stakes race. So that is potentially the beginning of a key race if Majestic uh, runs well. Um, so back to Mopatism, uh, who is the heavy favorite here. Uh, she did finish, of course, in front of Majestic quality in that race. A career best 101 figure, which is good for a lightly raced uh, horse of this caliber who's just a three year old. You want to see that kind of pattern towards the summer. Um, she's going to benefit from a pretty fast pace here because I think the, was it the five, Awestruck here, is stretching out. And I'll go to the, the uh, pace projector in a second. But Awestruck, as you can see here in sprints, is running fairly close up. So that kind of horse normally stretches out. I want to validate it. So I'm going to look, and yeah, there she is, Awestruck, in front uh, with a pretty fast fraction, 105 pace figure. So Awestruck's going to go a little too fast. That's going to benefit, benefit uh, Mopatism. And the other one I'm going to use is the one Overture, who's right here, because uh, 12 to 1 for Bill Mott, I'm just not going to pass this up. She gets beat nine lengths, and a lot of people are going to discount her based on get beat nine lengths. But when you remember who won that race, Unchained Melody, and what Unchained Melody did next time out, which is nothing other than winning the Mother Goose Stakes, a uh, pretty powerfully over lockdown was the heavy favorite that day who we did talk about on that big day racing. Uh, that's fairly significant to me that she won that race. Also, I just noticed, I'll go back, I hadn't seen this while I looked yesterday, Cursor, who was fifth of the race, uh, came back to win uh, out of, well, wait a second, is that a mistake? Cursor was running today. Oh, okay. So that so that's the power of the program. 
the running line's not in her lifetime PPs yet, but Kershaw must have won today. <laughs> That's all I can assume. Craig, would you assume that? Craig? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I'm sure it probably did because I, I've seen it happen. It, it happens yeah. pretty quickly that it gets circled in the chart bef <laughs> yeah, before the PPs. Yeah. So, so how's that, Steve, for finding a key race within hours? You're going to have to wait till the next day. Yeah, she was a the, the cursor was a big bet today. Yeah, well, and that's that. Then that makes it a key race because the first and fifth horses came back to win. So that's my play in the race: four majestic quality, uh, the eight, Moctezum, and the one overture. I'll bet a majestic quality to win, but I'll certainly make a smaller bet on overture. And my exact is going to be one four eight over one four seven eight. I'm throwing in wicked lick here uh, for the exact uh, to come in as a second play. Because even though she rarely gets there, her career record of one win in five seconds, she does kind of grind out here. She ground out second here. She ground out second uh, earlier in the Fairgrounds Oak. She ground out second in the Silver Bullet Day. She never gets within any hailing distance of the winner, but, of course, that's Farrell twice and then my sweet Stella. So maybe that's good. You could actually play a four-horse box here, but I'm going to play 148 over 1478, and then uh, I want to hear what Craig has to say. Yeah, so if we, uh, I, I, for this race, for me, I just went to the True Hods uh, module again. There you go. And if you can flip it to odds. Yeah, I, I forgot to set it as a default. Let me show folks, by the way, how that works real quick. You can display as odds or probability, so you click it to odds, and that'll be your default now. So there's my clicking on odds. Right, and then just uh, and then if you just um, can you sort sort it by adjusted true odds too? Yeah. Sure. Okay. And she's the top. Yeah. Right. So for me, just because um, majestic quality was um, rated slightly ahead of Mopatism, and with the odds of three to one versus seven to five, I, I, I'm just going to play it for value and also for all the reasons you said, Ellis, on on watching the video and and do you think the horse can improve? And so then for me, what I would do is um, box it with the highlighted horses. So that's Awestruck and Overture. And um, with more money on Overture, because of all the uh, reasons that you also gave Ellis in the race. And then um, you know, I'm, I would try to beat Mopatism. And it's not that I think there's anything wrong with the horse. It's, it's just like when you looked at those PPs, Ellis, and you saw that, that um, big Equibase speed figure, you know, sometimes a, a young filly yeah. uh, can go the other way off it, and it's not, you know, it's it's maybe 50-50, 60-40, I, I don't know, but just, um, you know, that that was a that was a big speed rating off a you know off a little bit of a, a layoff. So I, I just I'm kind of hoping that 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 can happen, and those other, those other horses can get in there. So I mean, for me, a a, a one four box is definitely a a nice play there and uh, and take a chance. Very nice. The uh, Indiana Derby, another set of runners that we've been seeing, and we've seen them since the Derby itself. Uh, IRAP came back, wins the Ohio Derby. Now he spins right to the back, and uh, Doug O'Neill's going to strike while the iron's hot. Wild shot had that huge performance in the Pat Day Mile, and this morning when I was talking about this race and the way it came up, I had to wonder out loud about the performance in the Pat Day Mile on the wet track, how much of that jump-up effort was wet track related, came to New York and really was very disappointing, obviously, in the Woody Stevens. Now he stretches back out to two turns, and you got to make a decision on that front. You've got a couple of horses that, uh, like uh, Colonel's Dark Temper, uh, who ran behind McCracken and ran very well behind McCracken in the Matt Wynn. Uh, Society Bow for Neil Howard shows up in here. Watch Me Whip was actually supplemented. It's only $2,000, which is pocket change to owner Dennis Allsbaugh, but uh, still, a supplement is a supplement. Uh, a nice group for the Indiana Derby, and we'll start it off with Ellis. Yeah, well, you know, I, I've not been a wild shot fan. I missed him in the Pat Day Mile. I think uh, you talk about him a lot, and, and he's a nice horse. But I think now is the time that I can jump in because 
this eight to one morning line is just completely out of out of line with reality, in my opinion. Um, he's almost on every other race pattern. Third back here in the fall in the Futurity, and then second in the Jack Cup Gold Cup. Uh, then takes time off. Fourth is Davis, obviously short because he makes the lead and gets tired without a prep off of that, you know, layoff. Then nothing again, and then you get bluegrass, and then but. This was a huge confidence builder for him in a field of 12 um, to just put them away, stock, stock the pace, and then the Woody Stevens, you know, not much at all. But he's got the three hole today. And when I look at the two horses inside, IRAP, who did kind of press the pace on slow fractions in the bluegrass, but otherwise he runs second or third. He has no interest in being on the lead, and certainly. Society Bo has the witness to being on the lead. When you look at where he usually runs here as I'm going over with my mouse. So Larry's going to go. And then the question is, what happens with a horse like Colonel Dark Temper? You mentioned Steve, who stretched out to two turns for the second time in his career. This was pretty bad in the Northern Spur. But he stretched out here and he stopped. And, you know, second McCracken's like winning a race within a race, in my opinion. Uh, what's going to happen with him? I don't think there's a lot of pace. I'll look at the true odds and the pace projection again to remind myself. Uh, it projects Wild Shot on the lead. Now, at the second call, project Colonel Dark Temper, who could be stalking. But well, if Colonel Dark Temper is actually in front here, which is possible, because he's going to have to use the horse to gain position before the turn, then Landry can sit second on Wild Shot. And then when push comes to shove, I have to ask myself, which horse is actually better? Well, certainly I have to say, that the great three stakes winner is going to be better than Colonel Dark Temper, even though I liked him since his debut. He's kind of a dark horse. I was hoping he ran to the Derby, but, you know, uh, Jinx Fires backed off a little, but he's a very nice colt by Colonel John. who runs all day here. So wild shot on the stretch out. We know he can run two turns here back from the Kentucky uh, Jockey Club effort uh, last year. Uh, go back to him. Back to his Kentucky Jockey Club effort here uh, when he, pressed the pace and made the lead and only got beat a length on a Kraken. Uh, you know, he, has, he has something in common now uh, with Colonel Dark Temper running second to the Kraken. Uh, that 110 from the Pate Mile, uh, it is the highest equity speed figure of any horse in this race, period. So, yes, it was one turn. Yes, it was wet. But it was big. And, again, he's got a pace edge. I will use Colonel Dark Temper because I don't think it's going to be a fast pace here. I think either way they could run one, two around the track and, 10 to 1 on this horse, a little hard to pass up because we know McCracken would be the same odds as Songbird, you know, 1 to 9 in this kind of situation. Um, he could drop in second. His 107 from the 7 for long win kind of is on par with the 110 echo base figure. Wild shot earned in his one turn mile win in the past day. I'm going to look also at the 8 awesome Saturday who uh, ran second. These horses have a lot in common. He ran second to Colonel Dark Temper in the allowance race. And it comes back to when Allowance race on his own. His two two turn races have been very good. He ran second here to Nomo Doe, who won the Sir Barton on Preakness Day, and then he wins here and he beats Watch Me Whip. So it's a it's a race I think you can make some money in because IRAP is going to be bet very heavily. And I'm not going to knock IRAP, but I'm going to say this: Look, his best races: 101 Echo Bay Speed Trigger in February, 99 in the Bluegrass, and 101 winning the Ohio Derby. And when I look at Wild Shot, his best is 110. And I look at Colonel's Dark Temper, and his best is 107. And I look at Always Saturday, and he ran a 106. I rap better have his game face on because he's going to need to pick up two and a half lengths in order to run as well as three horses in here at least. So for me, I'm betting a win bet on uh, Wild Shot, a small win bet on Colonel's Dark Temper, and I'm going to play an exacta with the – Three, Wild Shot, the Eight Awesome Saturday, the Ten Curls, Dark Temper over those three. But I'm throwing I Rap for second. I'm showing, throwing in Society Bow for second. The one, as you mentioned, I'm throwing in Watch Me Whip because he ran second to Awesome Saturday. And I'm throwing in Hollywood Handsome, who uh, had that issue where he got hit hard in the Belmont Stakes and the uh, Florent Giroux lost his irons. It could have been very bad, but it worked out well. He had a decent race before that. So my play, just in case you're writing down numbers, and we'll post this, by the way, on the forum, the, the Stats Race Hunts forum, but mine's going to be a 3, 8, 10 over 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 10, 11 
uh, it's going to be about $21 ticket uh, for a dollar exact. Then take a shot and hope to get one of those eight to one shots home. All right, Craig. Uh, yeah, so if we could just, you know, this part of the focus of this uh, webinar today was to use the true odds module. So I, I just want to look at that again. Yep, I'm going right there. There she goes. If you could just sort it on the adjusted true odds. And so um, for this race, um, according to the uh, race lens algorithms, I mean, nine and three are um, likely to be overlays since uh, they probably are going to go close off to their mor morning line odds. So those would be my two key horses uh, in this race. And then, um, you know, one other thing that I, I don't know if I didn't think of Ellis mentioned it, but um, uh, in the comment for the race projection, it does say that the pace is projected to slow down in the middle of the race, so that also bolsters uh, Ellis' thoughts on the number three wild shot. So, I mean, I do think he's, he, he is, uh, that even gives you more evidence or more more uh, reason to, to play that horse as well. Um, when you look at the other horses that are um, by adjusted rods that look like contenders, it's it's uh, the two and the eight. Um, obviously, at the price, the eight is one to put in. Um, with the two, um, like I said, at the low odds, it, it's um, it's not going to have any value. But um, you may still want to throw it into the exactas and tries. There was one thing I wanted to um, mention about the horse. Um, so uh, they're switching to, um, you know, Leperu was getting off, and they're switching to Mario Gutierrez. Uh, one angle that I have, uh, we don't need to bring it up, but one angle that I have in, in um, my, my set of angles that I created is, is similar to the way that um, Steve talked about how um, the trainer, you know, Albertani was doing better in the turf races. Uh, a lot of times I thought I've noticed when... Um, Gutierrez gets on a horse who he didn't ride last race. It, it, I've seen him bring in prices before. And so I ran a, a, an angle with that. So it was just um, Gutierrez is a jockey, and it's a switch. He didn't ride the horse last race. And so over the last year, out of 151 starts, he had 13% um, winners, but his ROI was plus 20% on that. So that, that was something that backed up my observation. And so even though losing Leperu is a negative – Getting Gutierrez is is a positive, so uh, you know I, it's one reason that maybe I wouldn't discount him as much, and so to leave him in in the exotics. Nice. I I, I thought this was a, a really fun group, and I you know I'd like to believe that one of the emergent horses that is is going to show up in here. Uh, like a, an awesome Saturday uh, who really ran a, a dynamic race, I thought, in that uh, in, in that allowance. Watch Me Whip is a horse that, that Dale Romans was touting well in advance uh, of the debut. And, you know, the fact that I know I know 2000 is not much of a supplement, but I, uh, I, I, I certainly was clued in on this horse early on, thanks to Dale. I'd like to I'd like to think that there, there's nothing here that is so you know is so dominant. Uh, I mean, I wrap I surprised me a little bit in that Ohio Derby. I, I I kind of wanted to make a case for Untrapped, who I'm I'm getting a little tired of. Uh, frankly, it seems like he's a horse that just is not is just not developing. He seems he seems at a at a, a neutral in the neutral gear and you watch him and you, you, you think that there's something encouraging about him and you just, just aren't getting anything back from him. So my inclination is to, is to try to find somebody that's going to stalk and, and close. And I, you know, I, if I had to, if I had to gun to my head right now, Austin Saturday, I, I really was impressed with. And, I, I'm not sure. I haven't, I haven't checked the, where we are. I think morning line was either six to one or eight to one. So eight to one. Eight to one. I, I, that's the kind of horse that 
in a race like this, I'd like to I'd like to play through. Well, I I, I agree 100. percent He's got that great style, and I've left on trapped off completely. I'm not even putting him in second. I wrap all default second because you know he he did show a little guttiness with Gervin last time out, but on trapped, you know this is the kind of horse that and and I think he's. You're not the only one that's kind of getting, I wouldn't say off him, but he is six to one morning line to here. And I think he's going to drift up. But you just look at his running lines. I mean, last time out, he had every opportunity. He completely outfinished by Rap and Gervin. And, you know, if you back up from the Derby in the Arkansas Derby, just outfinished. And the Rebel outfinished. In the Risen Star, uh, not outfinished, but he runs one pace, you know. Uh, one of these days, the lights will go on. He might run a heck of a race, but I don't think it's Saturday. Well, before we take a look at the Forbidden Apple, we'll swing over to Belmont. Uh, a very interesting group came together for closing weekend at uh, Belmont. And before we do that, let's look to some of the opportunities for those of you that are listening in terms of offers from, from Stats Race Lens. You know, obviously, number one, you should be following Stats Race Lens on Twitter. Uh, we've talked about the forum tonight, a great place to ask questions, to interact with other players that are use a lot, utilizing the platform. There are a couple of deals that are absolutely ridiculous values and true odds packages for Saratoga and Del Mar, $55 for Saratoga, 50 for Del Mar. The, Overall price, if you were to buy packages for Del Mar and Saratoga using stats, you would pay basically less than $2 a day per track. $80 for Saratoga, which is $2, and Del Mar, $75. And it, obviously it would take maybe one, one nice wind bed or one modest exacta to pay for the subscription. So if you haven't been if you haven't been a subscriber yet, this is a, a terrific opportunity to get involved and go every day. You know you're going to be playing Saratoga and or Del Mar. Subscribe and once you get into the habit and practice of poking around and utilizing all the different tools, you'll really come to rely. Uh, and you also get a chance to craft your own angles as well as the ones that are pre-installed. And uh, it doesn't take much. And you change, really, the way you approach the game. Let's approach the Forbidden Apple. Ellis, a horse from the Tony Dutro barn, speaking of, of streaky trainers who get, gets hot, gets into funks, uh, just a very tough to read, uh, particularly this first half of the year. Tony Dutro, get Jets, had every indication of being a good horse, and then kind of went sideways. And here he is refashioned as a turf horse, and it's worked. Uh, Tony's move to the grass has been a success. Yeah, before I talk about it, let me add one more thing about the promo, uh, and that great deal of $80 for Delmar, 75 80 for Saratoga, 75 for Delmar. That's for the meat, and that's a subscription. So for some of the people that have been buying day passes, um, and day passes give you access to almost everything, but not really – angles and things like that so if you get the description now you can take advantage of not just seeing the angles but setting up angles tweaking angles all the things you can do with the angles we talk about as well and then if you don't use it for a while someone asked me this week everything is still saved so uh all your settings all your tweaks everything else your templates they're all saved so you can come back let's say you want to come back for Gulfstream in december play the big meat you can sign up for a quarterly subscription then, and you can have access to everything again. So that's another reason why this is a fantastic offer if you're not already subscribing. Absolutely. Talking, talking about the Forbidden Apple, so it happens that, I, don't, I, I, I guess Steve did look, but I'm sure he made his picks on his own. Get Jets was my top choice in the race. I mean, he got, he's got the rail here for this mile trip, which is phenomenal. And like Steve said, here's a horse that was repurposed as a turf horse. You know, he, he wins the Sleepy Hollow last year as a New York bred. Um, he breaks his maiden. He runs second here in a big effort in the Bond Guard. Um, New York bred. And then he comes back October 15th, four months later, on the dirt. Doesn't do much. Doesn't do much. Boom on the turf. 
October 2016, five to two, seven horse field, great tracking trip, really exploded, gets beat in the neck, and then comes back, uh, scratched out of the Kingston, comes back in the allowance race, probably scratched because Dutro didn't want to run him on a wet turf. That's the great thing about merging the scratches, which I do. I merge my scratches, and I can see what happens here. And so May 29th, he comes back because he didn't want to run on the wet turf. He puts him in the race in the condition book. He probably had them both in on firm turf, and he runs, runs great again. Now, Iran Ortiz is going to move. Um, he rode – Iran Ortiz rode both um, – on my note here. Iran Ortiz rode both Get Jet – uh, last time out, and he also rode the outside. Uh, he rode the uh, outside outside Cerise's Prince to a win. So he's getting off two winners to ride Disco Partner. But of course, that makes perfect sense since Disco Partner just won the Grade Three Jiper for him. Uh, but there's not a problem here with Johnny V getting on uh, for Dick Dutro. Uh, they don't ride together a lot, but they're two for five together, so it's not a problem at all and uh, what's very interesting here I did this really quick just to see what those two were in case there was something like like Steve said Dutro being hot and cold if I change this to today's jockey um, and I will take it off a turf route because this is a dirt race it's a turf race anyway but I want to see all five of those so I'll just go all starters on distance and I'll go all starters on uh, surface. So now we're just looking at Dutro with Velasquez the last couple of years. And we know it's not a big number because the one-year number was two for five. The two-year number is two for 11. I want to see what those were. And I'm looking here and I'm thinking, I remember that race in the River 26 and 2016. That was something called the Remsen. And uh, Johnny V got on. He'd ridden the horse before. He rode that horse here for, uh, for Dutro. So when Dutro gives Johnny the leg up, uh, you know, it means something a little bit. And Cordero, of course, calling the shots for Johnny on this case. So Get Jets uh, looks pretty good here on those things. Um, and he's going to have a great spot. He's going to be sitting third on the rail, um, saving ground. Uh, there's a couple of horses, I think, on the outside. Uh, King Creesa, of course, the 10 horses to show here, uh, likes to have the lead. So he's going to be sent for sure here. And Cerise's Prince. you got the two very outside horses, even though this, one mile isn't two turns necessarily. It's got that long run. Um, you still have two horses here that need to lead, and that gives Sketchet a nice pace to run into. The other one I like is uh, another another one I like is the six offering plan, opening at four to one. Uh, I see Castellano Road riding back. He won the Kingston for New York Bread. I always like to look at state bread winners to see if they have an open win in their history, and I go back here and I see uh, here. Uh, I think he won, or maybe I missed it then. Uh, yeah, he won an open stake here. He won the English Channel, which I must have missed somewhere. There it is, the English Channel 6. So he won that, which was open, not state bred. So he's not just a state bred horse. And Castellano room to a win here, a fifth here, a third here, a win here, and a win here. So Javier's been up for three of his four career wins. Got to use him. And I also have to use Disco Partner, of course. I'm not going to throw him out, especially for any pick trees and stuff. He's going to be over bet. Five to two morning line, I don't think that's going to hold up. But here's a horse that had one to seven furlongs and one at six. The mile and the seven furlongs, at Belmont, in my opinion, aren't much of a difference. So those are my three. Um, get Jets, Offering Plan, and Disco Partner, and uh, kick it over to Craig. Yeah, so if we go to the True Odds module. Yep, right there. Sort on it. And just sort of yeah. So um so it's uh basically the same three horses um that uh Ellis liked. The only thing is that um that uh true odds like like the nine best, then six, then one. Uh I think, you know, for all the reasons that Ellis said, those are the the three logical horses. Um I kind of I, I because of the way that um the um, pace could play out because it, this says that the pace projects to be slow. I, I, I kind of that's one reason why I like the nine and the six a little bit better than than Get Jets when I'm looking at it. But um, you know I, I think if you play all three in the race, uh, 
you're going to be pretty safe when when you're playing your your horizontal bets. So that's that's the way it looked. And I think there was a uh, one last uh, bonus winner Ellis had for us today, the, a special race yeah, we wanted to look at. Before that, Steve. Uh, first of all, if you had any uh, thoughts on the race, and I want to mention this poor old horse who we all love, whose name is Mohamed. Um, I don't know. You probably are more tuned in than me as to what they're trying to do with this horse and why they're not retiring him. You know, I, I haven't heard anything other than the fact that Kieran has been hell bent to try him on the grass. And I can even, I think I even recall a, a conversation, you know, fairly early in, in Mohamed's career of all things. Uh, he wants to, he wants to, try him. I mean, there's nothing to do with him now at this point in the year. You know, you're not, you got to buy time until uh, until the breeding shed next year. So why not? Uh, but, you know, Kieran, what do you have him entered in? He had him entered in in something last month that came off the yeah. earth. July 7th, so we all on it was a, uh, a optional allowance claimer. Yeah, uh, so he he's been he's been looking to do this and and why not? I, listen, you got you got you got to buy you got another another four or five months. You, right. Try something with him. I mean he's he's going to stand. It's not like he it's not like he can hurt his his reputation at this point. So no, and 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 positives of this last couple of workouts of uh, June 29th, second best of 34. Uh, on the turf at Saratoga, and then at Belmont on July 9th, 47 and 8 10, best of 92 on the day on the dirt. So certainly he's fit. There's no question you're not going to work out 47 and, and 8 tenths and beat 91 other horses working out if you're not fit. Um, but, you know, it, it just seems like he's sour, but I don't know what to tell you. I just wanted your takes. A lot of people, I'm sure, out there watching the webinar are going to ask, well, what about Mohamed? They all this talk about it. So I appreciate your two cents on that one, Steve. Uh, and the the only horse that hasn't been brought up that I'll mention uh, is Grand Arch, uh, Brian Lynch, bringing him back, uh, the veteran eight-year-old. And this is a horse that's good off the layoff, and uh, he'll be fresh. Uh, he'll probably sit, I don't know, uh, look at the pace projector there. He's going to sit a good trip behind the speed and can adjust really to whatever pace unfolds. And Grand Arch, uh, you know, the one, it's funny, the one thing that, that uh, surprised me when I looked is, is that he, he's over for 2 and, and hasn't run particularly well at Belmont. But uh, Grand Arch, a horse I, I really respect, and uh, he certainly has been working well for the spot, and he has run well fresh. So. And he's a Just grade a, one winner. He's a grade one winner, the Peter Breeders' Cup winner. So yep, he'd be no, he's a back here. Exactly. So. Well, for those of you that uh, have put up with us for this long, Craig mentioned, I, I said, if anybody wants to put up with us for this long, I'm going to give you a, a present here. I hope it's a present. I can't promise. But I was just kind of looking around at some races at Woodbine on uh, Saturday, and I like to look for maiden specials, as people know that follow me, because that's where you get the money. And I went and looked, and I, I see this horse, Gizmo's Destiny, and I see these angles, which they're all pretty much the same, but they have to do with the dam. So I looked at Gizmo's Destiny, and I pulled it up, and this is the third race at Woodbine on Saturday, about 2.11 p.m., and this is a Canada bred uh, by Giant Gizmo, stands for 5,000 out of a mare named Victoria's Destiny, and I look at the, the mare's record here at the bottom with research, and it's lifetime dirt sprints, five horses, mm -hmm. 11 wins in 67 races, and certainly as a first-time starter, I want to know how they do, so I click on first-time starters, and this is where... I got a little excited. The Sam's had five foals, and they ran in 2012. That one ran six the first time out. But our last four foals, the one that ran in 2013, the two that ran in 2014, one was a two-year-old, one was a three-year-old, and the one that ran in 2015 is a two-year-old, uh, I believe, they're all one first time out. Five foals, four first out winners, and they were all favorites, seven to two, I'm not favorite, low odds, seven to two, five to one, four to five, and four to five. Three of them trained by Robert Tiller, who trains this for Ralph Davis. He owns a part of this horse. Maybe he owns the dam for all I know. And he's only so-so, to be honest, in terms of 
uh, first time starters, we can go just click real quick. Well, I'm sorry, I clicked on sorry by mistake. Click on trainer, and I can look at the last two years for trainer, uh, first time starter. I have all these different categories, but just all first time starters. Uh, made in special weight. I just passed it. There it is. That's on dirt. That include all weather. So that's fine. He's four for 42 with first time starters in the past two years. And when I sort on those, I didn't kind of line it up. But one of them I know is one of these horses. And I just know that there's something about this particular mare in the genes that does it. So the third race at Woodbine on Saturday, uh, he opens at 8 to 1, Giant Gizmo. It's a six horse field. Uh, only two of the horses have run. One of them ran second last time out for one Bofuls who uh, got a pretty low equity speed figure of 56, so he's beatable here as the 7-5 to five million line favorite. The only thing I don't like about this horse, and it, it's going to keep the price high, I'll be honest, Gizmo's Destiny is ridden by Sheena Ryan, who I don't know much about, but I do know that in the last year uh, in dirt sprints, 222 races, 8% win, uh, so a low percentage jockey. I think she's won for 105 so far in 2000. 17, um, or two, I should say three for 112 in 2017. But you know what? I'm betting the horse. I'm not betting the jockey here. So uh, I will tell you, by the way, that she's won for Tiller uh, twice in, uh, no, three times in 17 races uh, in the last year. So I think all her wins have come for him. Anyway, that's my gift. I don't know if Craig or Steve, what, what, what do you think of a dam that's had five bulls and four that have won first time out. This is the first time started, and there's nothing wrong with it. If you have a comment, go right ahead. No, that's a that's a gem. Yeah, one a, a couple weeks ago, that got one. one there, there was one that scratched the Gary Gaio scratch that last time we did the webinar. I was so disappointed. Yeah, I, I, Sorry, I mean, Craig. for me, this type this type of angle is is a is a good play. I mean, it's the type of things you look for with, you know, for when, whenever a horse is doing something new, a first time starter, a horse trying turf for the first time, going long for the first time, you're looking for clues like this. So it's the perfect perfect thing, and and that's when you bet a jockey like this. So yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly why the eight to one is going to hold up because everybody's going to look at that three for hundred and twelve record and say. I don't care about the pedigree, and I'm going to go the other way and say, I think the pedigree is uh, good enough to overlook the jockey, so we'll see what happens. Um, now, Craig had a couple of real quick notes you want to talk about, the later races at Delaware, which I'm going to go to real quick. So just just for anybody betting the pick threes, I can quickly just um, say who I liked. So in that 10th race at Delaware, um, there okay. looked like a, a, you know, it looked like the number five look like a uh, another clear winner. I know the race before unfortunately is um Songbird, but I mean they both look like they can be singled. And then if we jump to the uh, 11th race, it was a maiden claimer and uh just by looking at the the highlighted horses and, and adjusted true odds, um it, it looked like this was going to have a fast pace in this race. So it looked like it could set up for the the 6 if it gets to the outside, as the price projector says, um, the horse ran, a, 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 I think it was a 56 uh, equity speed figure last race, which is in line with the 57 class rating today. And then Mesmerize, even though um, Race Lens has it charted towards the front, um, the horse has been running um, turf sprints, if you look at the PPs, and has been finishing. So I think even if it is in the front, um, that should have it legged up and... Uh, I don't think it's going to be a problem. I mean, if there is a pace stool, I think it's the one that, that could survive. So th those are the, the two horses that I, I like to play play in that race. And you also had a bet against her. You mentioned Nobody's Angel, who's the 5 or 2 favorite. Yeah, just a, just a little bit because, uh, yeah, I know the, the angles. When, when horses finish um, far back two races in a row, I mean, it, it's even whether they drop or – or go on a layoff or anything like that. It, it still doesn't mean they're going to come back uh, to what to what they were before. So those those for me are just plays. To, I, I almost ninety percent of the time I'm going to play against a horse like that. So uh, I yeah, mean, it's uh, a bad favorite. I know the yeah yeah the horse could do it, but but it's like I'm not going to be on it when it does it. 
All right. So some great info, and that will help you finish off the late pick threes and pick fours at Delaware on a great card in which we get to watch Songbird in a paid workout. Well, and tomorrow morning uh, we'll have Rich Glazier from Delaware Park, one of the great, one of the great personalities anywhere in the sport, and uh, one of my favorite people to have on the show. Rich will talk about uh, the Dell Cap card, and uh, even have to include his great story about betting the Dell Cap uh, while he was a grunt in Vietnam. Uh, one of the <laughs> he managed to get a bet down from. Uh, <laughs> From the DMC. <laughs> Dedicated. Uh, so we'll That's dedication. <laughs> he's, he's the best. Uh, I want to thank Craig, of course, and Ellis, and all of you that joined us. Reminder again, do not miss this opportunity to lock in these deals. Subscribe for Saratoga and or Del Mar. It will really be a perfect opportunity to get into a flow, to be very focused, too. It's not like you'll be bouncing all around. You'll have one circuit, one set of races, and uh, you'll you'll get a, a unique opportunity to hone your skills using all of the tools available at Stats Race Lens. Follow Stats Race Lens, of course, on Twitter. Utilize the forum as well. And we'll look forward in a couple of weeks to getting back together, and we'll be looking at uh, any number of the terrific uh, race opportunities at Saratoga and Del Mar with Ellis and Lafitte and uh, Dan and Craig and everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Good luck if you're playing this weekend, and we'll talk soon. Good luck, everybody. Thank you.